From Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, and the home of Hot Chicken, it's the Rick Altizer Show. Sit back, buckle up. Rick will talk with the movers, shakers, and creators who put Christ in Christian entertainment. He's a man who's clear so the world can hear. Here's Rick Altizer. Thanks, Bob Allen, for that great introduction. I don't know why Nashville got the hot chicken title, but it did. So there you go. Today, you're about to hear part one of my interview with Steve Taylor. Steve is a recording artist, producer, record company executive, film director, and educator. Steve uh, reinvents himself every decade, and this episode focuses on the recording artist and producer part of his journey. As a recording artist, he's recorded the satirical songs Be a Clone, I Blew Up the Clinic Real Good, Color Code, and many others. His musical styles went through as many changes as he did hairstyles. As a music producer, he's worked with the Newsboys on I'm Not Ashamed, Shine, and others. And he produced Sixpence None the Richer, Kiss Me, and There She Goes. We discuss how you can't go to a woman's clothing store without hearing one of those songs every half hour. Maybe there's backward masking there, you know, buy this dress in the songs. I I don't know. But anyway, Steve was very gracious and generous with his time. I found him honest, open, always thoughtful, always engaging. He's just one of those guys you just like to hang out with. Here's part one of my interview with Steve Taylor. Well, my guest today, many of you will know, he's a singer, songwriter, Record producer, music executive, filmmaker, director, and now, don't tell anybody, professor. uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, Steve Taylor. Say hi to Steve. Thanks, Rick. (laughs) Say hi to Steve. We're all like the dating game or something. I know. Is there an audience here that I don't see? (laughs) So, uh, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. We are here in Lipscomb University, where you are a what? what? What are you here? I'm called the Filmmaker in Residence. I assumed that with that role would come some kind of residence, but I can't even get them to buy me a cot or anything. No, like, you know, so you, no I just plan. want a little place to, you know, <laughs> four o'clock, take a little 20 minute power nap. Nothing. So uh, I have to, you know, find a, a desk, desk to crawl under if I want to get a power nap. And, but um, when they came to me about wanting to start a, uh, a film program, I was intrigued because I'd heard that. It was a lot different place than I remember it being. You know, back when I had, I was in a band, Chagall Guevara, um, we would have Lipscomb students like sneak off campus and come and see our shows, <laughs> and, you know, on penalty of getting expelled. Because if uh, people knew they'd been to a rock concert at a club, they would get kicked out. Um, so uh, it was, uh, it's, it's kind of funny and um, ironic to be here uh, being a part of their film program, which is uh, off to a great start and uh, thriving. And um, they decided about a year ago, the dean said, hey, what if we started a contemporary music program? And I don't know if you know the the Church of Christ history is they don't even have instruments. Right, they don't have instruments. They don't have instruments in their church. Right, right. And uh, he said, what do you think? And I said, well, I think that's probably a terrible idea. Um, (laughs) uh, There's a school down the street, Belmont University, that's been doing that for a while quite well. So I said, you know, the only way that makes sense is if you got someone like maybe Charlie Peacock to run it. But I don't know why Charlie would be interested in doing that. So I called him up and hit him on a good day. And now he's <laughs> begun a contemporary music program that's really thriving as well. And um, it's been fun to see this. Uh, of course, Nashville is a growing place anyway right. and expanding. And it kind of feels like Lipscomb is uh, uh, in many ways kind of setting a new path in the arts and uh you know as we've talked about how do you be a uh a a faithful christian and uh and also strive for artistic excellence so that's what we're shooting for awesome and that's kind of been your life story is a little bit of that uh looking for my blending my christian faith with musical excellence and for those uh listening today uh i'll give you just a little background on steve back in the 80s he was uh Recording artist, so we're going to kind of take you, because it's it seems like you reinvent yourself like every decade. You become a, you, you're a recording artist, and then you become a producer, and then you become a re- record executive, and then you become a filmmaker, and now uh, you know a filmmaker and a, in, a resident filmmaker. Just but, constantly w- rising, a cot, but. yeah, that's right. <laughs> constantly rising to the level of my incompetence is what I'm doing. <laughs> 
I don't think so. But let's, right let's, about the time I get good at something, I decide, okay, well, now I'll try something else that I'm not good at. <laughs> well, well, let's let's start out in the 80s when you were signed by Bill Ray Hearn to Sparrow. Right. Many of our, our listeners might, might remember uh, I Want to Be a Clone, Steeplechase, um, We Don't Need No Color Code, right. which is uh, Bob Jones University. Right. A little uh, Valentine to Bob Jones University you know, at the time. So taking us the, 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 the prejudice and Christian... You know, in the Christian culture, taking a, a shot at that. I blew up the clinic real good. Uh, again, another shot at how do we deal with, with the abortion issue by blowing up clinics and taking a, a satirical uh, view of that. And so um, I, I'd like to start off, how did Billy Ray Hearn, how did you get a record deal through Billy Ray Hearn? How did all, all that come together? Yeah, you know, sadly, Billy Ray passed away a few months ago. Right. And um, uh, being at his uh, memorial, we'd stayed in touch through the years, but it reminded me of uh, what a huge influence he'd had in my life and the life of many others. Um, uh, the situation was I'd been asked to do a couple songs at lunchtime at a gathering for, uh, I think it was called the Christian Artist Seminar in the Rockies in Estes Park, Colorado. And I'm from Denver. Um, so I, I don't mean to together. interrupt, but you're yeah. also a PK, aren't you? Is That's you, right. Was your yeah. dad a pastor? Yeah, my dad is a uh, Baptist pastor in uh, Denver is where we grew up. And so um, so I studied, you know, sang in church and studied music in college <laughs> and um, got into punk rock and new wave music uh, in the 80s and uh, started writing some demos. And the guy who organizes that event, he said, why don't you come and do a couple songs at lunchtime? And uh, so I put a band together. It was the first time I'd performed live in a band and uh you know it went well and uh people liked it and billy ray was in the audience and it was just you know that old i got off the stage and he was waiting there held his hand out said i want to make a record and it was really as simple On as your that first gig first gig right yeah, yeah you did one gig and there's right. billy ray hearn giving you a record deal right I, and honestly i mean you know he's a musician but he's like a choir director but he, he was always musically astute i still don't know to this day if it was because he genuinely loved the music or he just saw that people seemed to really respond to it mostly you know it was a young audience and so um but he was fantastic to work with he gave me like complete creative freedom um but he was also really supportive with his entire staff they all got behind it and uh and they i, I just felt like i was i'd landed it in the perfect place i had tried uh earlier to get signed on a mainstream label. I, I had written these songs and uh, same songs that went into the first EP, I Want to Be a Clone and What's Going to Do When Your Number's Up. Um, my barber, I was going to Boulder to college and my barber there, we'd talk and what are you doing? I've written some songs. Oh, can I hear them? So I gave him a tape and he said, man, this is really good. Can I give it to my friend who owns the bookstore who used to be a publisher in LA? I said, yeah, sure. And so that guy liked it and he said, hey, let me set you up with some meetings in Los Angeles with some, you know, Warner Brothers and Arista Records or people like that. So I went to California for the first time and um, and sat with these different A&R people and they had heard the music and they said, you know, listen, this music is good. Like, you know, it's interesting and it's kind of punk rock, new wave kind of fusion. We like your music, but these lyrics, like, they're not really gospel lyrics, but they don't really fit within what we do. And, you know, we like the music, but I think your lyrics would offend our listeners. So I thought, well, if it's the Christian content, then I should go talk to Christian record labels, right? So before I left, I met with Word Records in L.A. and Sparrow Records in L.A., and they listened to it, and their response was, uh, we don't like your music, and your lyrics would offend our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much where I've lived the rest of my life. <laughs> but, Offending uh, somebody. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> but Billy Ray, you know, nine months later heard it fresh he had not heard that original tape even though sparrow was his label a, a, a different a and r guy had heard it and you know not knowing anything about it he responded and here we are now you graduated boulder uh That's colorado right. university with a degree in, in uh, film and it was actually a degree in music, music and music? it was like a minor in film and so um yeah either one of those uh 
majors at the time was kind of known as the zero job prospect degree. But uh, <laughs> when you put music and film together, they actually create a future unemployment vortex. <laughs> and eventually, not to make money. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, and eventually it produces a modern barista. So um, <laughs> you're listening to the Rick Altizer show on Bot Radio 89.1 FM 1160 AM Nashville. It's like a beautiful, <laughs> a it's beautiful like what flowering. They say, the joke in Nashville. What are the first words you hear when you meet a Nashville songwriter? Your pizza's ready. Yeah, that's right. right. Exactly you know, right. Yeah, so, yeah. Anyway, uh, I digress. But uh, I noticed in, in a lot of your 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 songs, okay, in the eighties, I blew up the clinic real good. Steeple Chase, uh, I want to be a clone. Uh, they seem to be addressing hypocrisy in the church. Right. There seems to be like an ongoing, almost like it's a a drive to communicate about hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. Was that something that kind of came out of being a PK, seeing that, maybe dealing with some of the rejection, uh, you know, what, what kind of birthed that, that heart to, to be a whistleblower and say, hey, this is, this is hypocrisy. Right. Well, when you grow up as a pastor's kid, you're on the inside. And, um, you know, <laughs> the cliche of a pastor's kid is that they go bad because uh, they're on the inside. Um, that was not the case with me. My, my, my dad, although he was a, a pretty conservative guy, he was, a, he was a, a, a kind of a conservative pastor in a more liberal Baptist tradition, American Baptist tradition. Um, but he and my mom were, while being conservative, they were very consistent between what they said and what they did. So I wasn't looking at hypocrisy within my parents or within my own family necessarily. Um, but, you know, when you're on the inside of a church, you certainly see, you see it from all sides. And um, I, I think some, somewhere early on, I don't know if it was a combination of being influenced by more, you know, satirical comedy or, you know, satirical songwriters. But I just thought, well, you know, satire, that's a it seems like a good way to get a point across without uh, without it being preachy, because, you know, that's the other thing about growing up as a preacher's kid is you hear a sermon every Sunday. And my dad was a fantastic uh, preacher, good with illustrations, you know, never used notes amazingly. Um, uh, so I, I learned communication from my dad, um, but I wasn't interested in being a preacher. And uh, and yet I was you know, I, I believed in Christianity. I, I believed in what my faith taught. Um, and yet at the same time, I'd be really bothered at things like, you know, at the time, Bob Jones, discriminatory policies against uh, non-white students, right? So how does that, how do you uh, address these issues without it just being artless and propaganda? And satire seemed like a good way to do it. And, you know, I've said this before, but when Jesus says, uh, you know, take the log out of your own eye before you uh, worry about the splinter in your, in your brother's eye, that's a pretty good example of satire, I think, you know, and hyperbole when uh, Elijah calls down fire and is taunting the prophets of Baal, he's using very satirical, you know, sarcastic language. Sar- yeah, sarcasm. Um, so it felt like a like a good way to get a point across and communicate in kind of a subversive way. And, and, and even in, we'll get into your, your, your movies later, but the Blue Like Jazz, it, it seemed to be an ongoing theme. And it seems to be a theme of something that, you, that is, seems to be important to you is looking for authenticity in your faith. Yeah, well, I think, I think you know, I think people don't, you know, how many people really reject Jesus? That's a tough thing to do. I, I think they're rejecting hypocrisy in the church, right? And unfortunately, it's oftentimes hypocrisy that gets the most attention. Um, you know, we could have a whole other argue about the difference between hypocrisy and shamelessness, which, you know, we're mm-hmm. in a society more that's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, hypocrisy would actually be kind of refreshing these days. Yeah. Now it's just like <laughs> shamelessness is more the, 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 yes. the order of the day. But, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's very, very astute. Yeah, right. But, you know, how do you, um, 
how do you communicate to people who – how do you communicate, frankly, to people who feel like – it used to be we were taking a message to people who didn't know who Jesus was. Now they feel like they know what Christianity is and they've rejected it. How to communicate with those people? you got to do it in – subversive ways in ways that aren't that they're not expecting you know in the 80s and and 90s music seemed like a great way to do that i I mean i genuinely love music i'd probably be doing it anyway but like we were saying i i'm interested in hopefully making artifacts that actually mean something you know and when i made the jump to film it was because it seemed like film was a more interesting mode of communication and offered more possibilities but you know, ultimately, we all have something inside us and it's got to get out and uh, we find whatever artistic medium we we think we can, if not master, at least pull something together to see if it means anything to people. Just something else to not make money with. You know, <laughs> that's that right. Exactly. <laughs> Just kidding. Maybe that's the book I should write. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, this is the Rick Altizer Show and I'm interviewing my guest, Mr. Steve Taylor. And so, uh, coming from the '80s, so you, you you were you know quite a well-known Christian recording artist. Mm-hmm. You you had success, uh, you know, in that world. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know how that success is measured. And then uh, you you started a a label, Squint, right? Yeah. A record label, and then signed. Uh, now, Sixpence None the Richer were they on your label? Were yes. they on Squint? That was actually why we started the label. Was so you, so you you had this uh, this song that they did and. You know, you can't go shopping with your wife. <laughs> That's right. I'm not. It's a law. It's actually a, it's not just a state law. It's a national law. You can't sell girls dresses or shoes in any store in any mall where Kiss Me is not played at least every 30 minutes. That's right. That's and, right. And here she uh, here she goes, has to come about every 45 minutes. That's so right. To this day, you still hear uh, Kiss Me. That's right. When my wife is shopping, I'm going with my wife. The song will be on, guaranteed. I feel like TJ Maxx owes me a pr- percentage of their sales, <laughs> like uh, you know. Um, but that's true, yeah. So, so you you're you've had a you know fairly successful Christian recording career, right. and so you you produce uh, Sixpence None the Richer, and then you have this song, right, which becomes something unbelievable. When did you know the song was blowing up? When did you know the thing was just going to become something yes. something else? Uh, we had um, the the song had actually, we'd been working it for almost a year and um, it was a situation where we were, you know I, I started a label just because Sixpence needed a home and I'd produced this album and their label had gone bankrupt so they didn't trust anybody, so they said, you know, could you figure out something with this? So that was really the point of starting the label. It was an independent label, um, but we aligned ourselves with um, Gaylord Entertainment, a big corporation that had deep pockets, and they agreed to fund the effort. And so um, uh, it took about a year of work for it to finally make it into the bottom of the Hot 100, um, partly because the band was really good. Uh, they worked really hard. They were traveling all over the country, setting up. We'd buy pizza at a radio station, and the staff would come in, eat pizza, and listen to the band play. So first of all, they could actually play their instruments, which you know in that era was a rarity for a right. band, top uh, top forty band. And second, they were just really nice people, you know, genuinely nice. So I think all these radio stations decided, you know, if we're going to do one nice thing this year for a indie label, let's make it for Sixpence because we like them. So they started getting added across the country. But uh, one weekend, uh, my wife and I were taking a break. We were down in Florida. And um, four or five movies had heard Kiss Me and wanted it to be in their movie soundtrack. And they tended to be like younger skewing movies. Movies. Well, I saw them all. And the one I thought, let's do this one, was a movie called She's All That. It wasn't necessarily the best of the movies, but it seemed... I don't know. I just liked it better than the other ones. We go to the theater on a Friday night. The theater is packed with teenagers and, you know, Sixpence is, Kiss Me is kind of like the theme song in that movie. And like I walked out of the theater thinking, wow, I think we got something here. And on Monday, the phones just started blowing up across the country and uh, Kiss Me vaulted from low on the Hot 100. I, you know, it's one of those things. I think it would have been eventually a hit anyway, but exposure in that movie just vaulted it into, uh, ultimately, it was the number one in 10 countries around the world. Uh, it, was a, it was a big hit. You can't really escape it anywhere. <laughs> so so we've had this life of, uh, I, I do a show and I get a record deal, 
and I've been a fairly successful Christian artist, but this right. is a whole other level. So now, how you know what what happens now? Now, now what happens that you've got this? Right. Well, in, in the in the interim, um, I'd done a band. Uh, I decided to retire as a Christian artist just because it just felt like it was time to do something different. And that's when we started this band, Chagall Guevara, which got signed to a mainstream label. That experience was an entirely different experience. Uh, interesting, good in some ways. The band wasn't particularly successful, but um, uh, they still wanted to make another record with us because their other rock bands were even less successful. <laughs> and we were so desperate to get off MCA that um, uh, we decided we, we got a lawyer and we were just going to try to sit it out. And uh, during that time when we couldn't do anything, couldn't record anything, actually, that was when I started producing because uh, a label in town, a Christian label, had this new Australian band, Newsboys. And um, they, uh, the a r guy said, hey, we got this band. They've done a couple records. They haven't really done anything yet. But they've got this song they're working on called Not Ashamed. And um, we think, they think they need help with the lyrics. We agree. Uh, could you take a look at it and maybe see about writing some lyrics? And so they sent me the demo. It was kind of catchy. It was kind of tuneful. Um, I agree the lyrics weren't very good. Uh, but I loved the the idea of the song was I'm not ashamed to speak the name of Jesus Christ. And we had just been through kind of a season with our, our band where um, one of the, the biggest uh, arguments we got into within the band was, do we do a play a Christian festival or something like that? Cause we didn't want to get tagged as a Christian band, right? We just thought that was going to be the kiss of death back then. There wasn't, you know, there weren't any real crossover bands or anything like that. And, and that kind of that whole argument you know was was exhausting and then i get this song i'm not ashamed to speak the name of jesus christ it's like oh, i love this so i finished the lyric for them and then said hey why don't i produce this for them the label loved it the band loved it and so i ended up doing all this stuff with newsboys and that ultimately is what led to the sixpence gig is because they'd heard my production with other bands and wanted to work with me and so so when i started the label it was really not just informed by the producing, but it was also informed by this experience I'd had on a mainstream label and wanting to see artists that were Christians uh, exposed to a bigger, um, the larger culture and a, a bigger arena. And a guy named uh, Bob Briner had written a book called Roaring Lambs, mm -hmm. and he ended up being a real mentor to us and to the label and um, our great advisor and um uh, and in fact, uh, the last time I talked to him, I was calling him from England where Sixpence was going on top of the pops and they were about ready to have it end up being the second biggest uh, song of the year in England and was just telling him, you know, he had been following the story. And I just said, man, it's all happened. You know, everything that you talk about in your book, we're seeing come true with uh, Sixpence. And, you know, he was really sick at that point and he died a few months later. But it was just gratifying for him to have been such a part of that story and followed it. And in many ways, the, the, the apex of the Sixpence story was when uh, Sixpence went on Letterman. They performed, uh, I think, There She Goes. And uh, at the end of it, Letterman called Lee over to sit on the couch to talk, which he never does with musicians, right? But he mm -hmm. had a few extra minutes. And uh, he wanted to know where the name came from. And Lee ended up telling him this beautiful story about how in C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, he talks about, you know, a child asking for money from his father so he can buy him a present and how, you know, ultimately the father is sixpence, none the richer because, uh, you know, he already gave the child the money to buy his own present and how that it, uh, that's how why should, we should be humble with the gifts that God gives us because they come from God. And so we should use them humbly to serve him. And David Letterman, instead of being, you know, snarky, like he always is and making a joke, he like said, you know, that's exactly right. He said, and, and if all of us carried around that pearl of wisdom and, you know, he was really touched by it. And so, it's awesome. you know, I was, that was on many, in many ways, that was the, the best part of the whole experience was my wife and I were sitting in the audience and we couldn't believe this was happening on yeah. David Letterman on national TV. So that well, was a good moment. Well, that concludes part one of my interview with Steve Taylor. Next week, we continue the discussion and we learn about his transition from music to film. It's a great interview and you don't want to miss it. Hey, I'd like to give you a free scripture memory record that I made. Just go to my website, rickaltizer.com, and click the contact button. 
Or how about liking my Facebook page, facebook.com slash Rick Altizer Show. Altizer is spelled A-L-T-I-Z-E-R. I want to thank Paul Winkler, the investor coach, for sponsoring this show. And I want to thank you for listening. So be sure to check with us again next week as we discuss how we communicate the gospel through media to our culture. Let's be clear so the world can hear. For God did not send his sons into the world.